Hi, today I'd like to continue my series on industrial gas turbine combustors. In this episode, I'd like to talk about airflow and cooling. I will focus on single burner silo combustors, but a lot of what I'll talk about is relevant to all gas turbine combustors. In later videos, I'll expand this topic to include premix combustion, annular combustors, and finally modern can annular combustors. In those videos, I'll focus on the differences to single burner silo combustors. So hopefully each video will provide new information and will not be repetitive. Therefore, if you want to learn everything, it will be necessary to watch the full series on this topic. If you haven't already watched part one of the series, I've included a link below in the description. Let's begin at the inlet to the combustor. Air exiting the compressor exits with a relatively high axial velocity. Pressure losses are a function of the velocity squared. So the higher the velocity, the greater the losses. As the turbine generates power by expanding the flow, any losses, which will result in a reduced pressure drop across the turbine, will result in a reduced amount of power produced by the engine and a reduced overall engine efficiency. Therefore, it is important to minimize as much as possible the pressure drop across the combustor. Having said this, modern gas turbines have air-cooled vanes and blades in the first stages of their turbines. This allows them to cope with higher turbine inlet temperatures than uncooled blades, as increasing turbine inlet temperature will increase the efficiency of the engine this is a means to improve overall engine performance. However, to feed cooling air to the first vein of the turbine, the pressure of that air needs to be greater than the outlet pressure of the combustor. The air is normally fed to the vein at the compressor outlet pressure through the cavity contained by the outer pressure casing of the combustor. Thus, there needs to be some pressure drop across the combustor to drive this cooling air. This required pressure drop establishes the minimum pressure drop that the combustor must achieve. Okay, going back to minimizing this pressure loss, the first way to do this is to slow the flow down. There is a second advantage in doing this, which can be seen from Bernoulli's equation. Bernoulli's equation is essentially an equation for energy conservation. Bernoulli stated that the total pressure is equal to the static pressure plus the kinetic energy of the flow, or one half the density times the velocity squared. The total pressure represents the total energy of the system, and the static pressure represents the potential energy of the system. Provided there are no losses, the total energy or total pressure remains constant. Thus, slowing the flow down will convert kinetic energy into potential energy and the static pressure will rise. To minimize the losses in this process, which will contribute to a drop in total pressure and hence reduce the gain in static pressure, a diffuser is added to the outlet of the compressor. The air exiting the diffuser enters a large plenum contained by the outer pressure casing of the combustor. Before this air is fed to the burners and secondary air bypass, a fraction of it is used to cool the hot wall of the combustion chamber. Here, velocity and turbulence become important again as they contribute to cooling effectiveness of this air. Raising both of these again will lead to an increased losses. However, this is controlled so that the, the required cooling is achieved with the minimum losses. To achieve this, there are a number of cooling technologies which are employed. Air is normally first injected into a cooling sleeve, which in the case of the single burner silo combustor typically cools only the transition piece between the main body of the combustor and the turbine inlet. This transition piece at first glance seems fairly simple. It transitions the flow from the cylindrical channel of the combustor to the annular channel of the turbine. However, within the cooling sleeve, the flow is quite follows quite a complex three-dimensional path, which is extremely difficult to optimize. Some manufacturers have multiple combustors feeding this transition piece, 
which you might think makes this more complicated, but actually simplifies the cooling flow somewhat, as there are more routes around the circumference for, of the annulus for the flow to exit. However, nevertheless, this component is the most prone to overheating damage because it is the most difficult to optimize for cooling. Early designs were optimized using simple models to model the flow, which could be calculated by hand and also testing. However, with the development of electronic computers and the introduction of computational fluid dynamics in the latter part of the 20th century, finally a more comprehensive understanding of the flow could be achieved and the reliability of these components increased significantly. Air enters the cooling sleeve through holes in the outer wall of the cooling sleeve, close to the turbine inlet. These holes produce jets of air which impinge on the inner wall of the sleeve, or outer wall of the combustion, combustor. This is known as impingement cooling, and this produces a region of high turbulence and high heat transfer in the vicinity of the location where the jets stagnate on the inner wall. You can experience this sort of cooling if you sit, sit facing a fan aimed directly at you. This elevated level of turbulence remains in the flow and slowly decays as the flow moves downstream away from the jets, producing a larger region of elevated heat transfer. Rows of jets aligned in the flow direction will reduce the performance of this technology. I exaggerate this effect in this picture for emphasis, but effectively the first jet will produce the greatest amount of cooling as this jet is injected into stagnant air within the cooling sleeve. However, the second jet will encounter flow from the first jet as it flows downstream. The third jet will encounter flow from the first and second jets and so on. So each successive jet will be injected into a growing cross flow. This cross flow reduces the penetration of each successive jet, deflecting it downstream. Thus the momentum of the air from the jet when it reaches the inner wall will be reduced. And if enough jets are aligned like this, eventually the jets will no longer be able to reach the inner wall. Now there are ways to reduce this effect by staggering holes or increasing the diameter of downstream holes to give their jets more momentum. But even doing this, there is still a diminishing return from having too many rows of jets. Thus, impingement cooling is limited usually to the, the region where the air enters the cooling sleeve or is used sparingly in regions where enhanced heat transfer is required. Downstream of these rows of jets, the majority of the cooling is performed by convective cooling. This is achieved by blowing air across the surface of the inner wall parallel to it. When you sit with a fan blowing air past you, but not directly at you, you experience convective cooling. As the flow travels downstream of the impingement cooling zone, the turbulence decays and the flow develops into what is called fully developed flow. Friction at the wall causes the air immediately next to the wall to stop. And as you move further and further away from the wall, the air velocity increases until it reaches the velocity of the bulk flow far away from the wall. The shear in the flow due to this gradient in velocity generates turbulence. And this region of reduced velocity next to the wall is known as the boundary layer. The boundary layer limits the heat transfer. Airflow next to the wall heats up to near the wall temperature at the surface. Air is an excellent insulator as the molecules in air are so far apart, so there is very little conduction of heat in air. Thus, the majority of the heat diffuses into the bulk flow where it is carried away mainly through turbulent convective transport. Thus, the smaller the boundary layer and the greater the turbulence, the, greater the, the higher the rate of heat transfer. One way to enhance this process is through the introduction of turbulators on the inner wall. These are small obstacles, mostly perpendicular to the flow, which as you can see, if you look at the side, trip the flow and produce small wakes, enhancing the turbulence generated inside the boundary layer. The effect of this is to energize the boundary layer and enhance the transport rate of heat from the air next to the wall to the bulk flow. Angling these turbulators causes the wake from them to roll up and drive a single vortex above the surface of the wall, 
which can be seen if one looks in the direction of the flow. This draws high energy, high velocity air from the bulk flow towards the wall on one side and pushes low energy, low velocity air away from the boundary layer outwards into the high velocity region of the bulk flow on the opposite side. The effect of this is to energize the boundary layer giving even more than perpendicular turbulators. On wider channels, V-shaped or W-shaped turbulators are employed to drive multiple vortices to achieve this effect. Turbulators, while improving heat transfer, effectively increase the wall friction losses and so will contribute to a greater pressure, pressure loss. Thus, they are only employed in regions where there is insufficient cooling from normal convective cooling without turbulators. Now that we've discussed the major cooling technologies utilized to cool the transition piece, let's revisit the complex three-dimensional nature of this component. Airflow will take the path of least resistance. Generally, the air will want to take the shortest route through the cooling sleeve. However, to adequately cool all of the transition piece, it is important that we have sufficient air that reaches all parts of the transition piece. To achieve this, additional impingement cooling holes are placed in various locations to feed air into the cooling sleeve to ensure as even a cooling air distribution as possible. But this is often not enough. Let's look at a typical problem which can occur. To simplify this, let's consider a straight section of an expanding duct, which is a small segment of a larger system. In other words, there is a duct upstream and downstream of this section, which we do not see in this simple model. Downstream of this duct, there is some sort of resistance, which the flow in the middle of the duct sees. This resistance could be some sort of obstacle, or it could simply be a longer flow path to the outlet of the whole system. The effect of this resistance is that the air preferentially flows at the sides of the channel. This leads to reduced cooling in the center of the duct and a region of overheating damage on the inner wall of the cooling channel shown in red. Now, the intuitive thing to do would be to introduce impingement cooling holes over the region where the overheating is occurring to bring more flow into the channel at this location. However, this doesn't always work Remember, there is something downstream which is causing the air to preferentially travel to the sides. More times than not, doing this simply moves the overheating region upstream a little and does not solve the problem. Sometimes it may even make the problem worse. The reason for this is that the impingement jets are also seen by the flow as an additional blockage, increasing even more the resistance to the flow to follow the path through the middle of the channel. An alternative approach is to try to balance the downstream resistance by introducing impingement cooling holes at the sides. There is no overheating problem here, but the impingement jets will increase the resistance for the flow at the sides, balancing the resistance so that the flow in the center will now see this route as a route of less resistance. Thus, the overall flow will be more even and the problem will be solved. Impingement jets are an easy way to fix this in, an, in existing hardware, but an alternative to this in a new design would be to introduce structural obstacles in the flow to, to equalize the flow resistance. When you consider the complex 3D nature of the geometry, you can understand now how challenging it is to ensure that an even airflow is supplied everywhere across this complex cooling sleeve. Moving downstream closer to the flame, cooling requirements become even more important. Upstream of the secondary air injection, the hot gas temperature within the combustor is much higher. The diffusion flame of the single burner silo heats up the wall of the combustor through two major processes. The convection of high temperature gases towards the wall transfers heat into the wall. Additionally, the diffusion flame of the single burner silo also produces a large amount of smoke or soot within the fuel-rich regions of the flame, which produce a lot of radiation. A fraction of this radiation is absorbed by the walls of the combustor and turned into heat.
To provide better cooling in this region, two technologies are typically employed. The first of these is film cooling. You can see that the walls of the combustor close to the flame region are gradually stepped in radially. Where these steps occur, cooling air is injected next to the hot wall of the combustor to produce a film of cool air, which shields the wall from the hot gases. Another technology which is frequently employed closer to the burner is effusion cooling. This is where a large number of tiny holes are drilled into the wall, producing a sieve-like appearance where small jets of cooling air can pass through. Combustors are typically made of nickel-based alloys, which are capable of withstanding very high temperatures. Attempts have been made to make combustor components from ceramics, which are able to withstand even higher temperatures. Siemens, for instance, has introduced ceramic tiles, similar to what one sees on the heat shield of the space shuttle. The problem with combining ceramics with metal components is that ceramics do not expand as much when they are heated. Ceramics are also much more brittle than steel and do not respond well to tensile stresses. Thus, cracks in ceramic parts can occur due to the thermal expansion and contraction of metal parts with which they're interfaced. Siemens avoided this problem using an innovative approach for mounting their tiles and leaving gaps between the tiles, allowing them to move without colliding with nearby tiles as their metal supports expanded and contracted. These tiles and their metal supports require some cooling though, and the gaps between the tiles leads to a degree of air leakage into the combustion chamber. This is not so much of a problem in a single burner silo combustor operating with a diffusion flame where not all of the air is required for the combustion process, but it is more problematic for premix combustion where most of the air is needed for the burners to minimize emissions. This will be discussed in more detail in the next video. A compromise which has been introduced on many engines has been to coat the hot surfaces of the metal components with a ceramic coating. This coating consists of particles of ceramic material rather than a continuous sheet. And so the particles can separate as the metal they are embedded in expands. This coating acts as an insulating layer, allowing the walls to survive higher temperature hot gases than the underlying metal would be able to survive. In conclusion, you can see that there are many different approaches to cooling the walls of such a combustor. Most of these technologies are used in all different types of combustors, so they are not just limited to silo combustors. However, silo combustors have the particular challenge of cooling their complicated transition piece between the combustor and turbine. The transition piece also contributes to issues on the hot gas side. Ideally, for the maximum efficiency, the turbine would like to see a uniform profile in terms of volume flow and temperature at its inlet. But this is also challenging to achieve in such a configuration. This is one of the main reasons for the shift away from silo combustor technologies towards annular and canannular combustors, which will be discussed in more detail in future videos. Okay, so this concludes this video. In the next video, I want to focus on the introduction of premix burners to silo combustors. I hope you liked this video, and if you did, please click the like button below. And if you'd like to see more videos like this one, please subscribe to the channel. Thanks.